good evening everybody also from my side. Thanks to Vika for the kind introduction. And today I'm here to speak to you about gene therapy, which is a revolutionary medical approach that has been around in the field for over almost two decades, more than two decades, but just now is reaching the point where actually can reach the wider public. First of all, before going into the technique, I want to ask you and see which audience we have here tonight. Who of you actually have heard of gene therapy? Please raise your hand. Oh, okay, a lot. <laughs> who actually, who of you knows how gene therapy works from a biological point of view? Okay, this makes me a bit safer that I will not bore you too much. And for those of you who already know, I hope you get some new knowledge. It's important, I think, first of all, to go through the definition that the genetist gives to this uh, approach, which is uh, replacing or correcting a mutated gene within the cells affected by the disease with the aim to treat or prevent the disease. So basically curing disease uh, with, the help of, uh, with the help of DNA and genetic engineer. Before going into concepts that are fundamental to get what gene therapy is, that is mutation and gene, I was just thinking how to link a bit more with our daily life, also for those of you who didn't raise the hand, <laughs> not even the first time. And uh, actually something that always we actually are mu we listen a lot about genes, modification and so on, just in popular culture with movies. For example, I think one reference that all of us knows is X-Men, right? So suddenly uh, there is a future, well, or a past or a present, according to the movie you refer to, in which suddenly some genetic mutation appear in these people and then they acquire superpowers. Uh, well, this is quite unrealistic, but still gives an idea for something that I think is a bit more precise of what gene therapy is or could be in the future, even if uh, still far away, which is Gattaca, which I think is a really nice movie <laughs> at the end of the 90s in which basically there is uh, um, the possibility in the soon future to modify the DNA of your kid before it's born in a way that you create a genetically perfect indi um, individual. But this leads, the genetically perfect, I means that uh, it, it will not develop disease like all of us are susceptible to. But then leads to a bias in society between those that actually do not want this technique and those that actually apply, creating perfect human beings and those that are not, which is means like us. Uh, I believe. <laughs> and then, uh, so now we get like uh, what actually in the movies we may think about genes and mutation, but what actually really is for biologists. First of all, this is an organism like us, human being, and all of us have in common that we are all made by cells, you know? And all of these cells basically uh, carries an information that makes them uh, unique, you know? Uh, I mean, common in a way, but also unique in their function, so that we have different cells in our body. And this information is the DNA. If you allow me, the comparison is like a book. Uh, the book contains a lot of characters that all together bring uh, like, uh, a specific information, a, a speci specific knowledge that makes this, specific this cell unique. And if we look into details, actually DNA is made like books. It's made uh, by letters that all together create, you know, per se, these letters doesn't have much of a meaning, but then when you put these letters together, you create a word, which is a functional, like a functional piece of this DNA that is a gene. And this gene code for a protein, a molecule that makes, uh, if you sum all this protein within a cell, makes this cell specific for its function. So that's why we have brain cells, that's why we have cells of the eye, because there are specific genes in these cells that get activated and makes this cell uh, specific for their function. Uh, it's important to remember that constantly throughout our life uh, uh, we grow, we age, uh, we, l we get uh, wounds, uh, and we need to regenerate the cells, right? And this means that we need to copy this information along uh, our life many, 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 many times. And you have to keep in mind, if you, keep, uh, if you think about the numbers, that we have trillions of cells in our body, millions of cells that daily are renewed, when we lose skin or hairs, and each of these cells contain a code, uh, a sequence of letters that is 3.2 billion. So if you're better than me in making math, you can imagine how many times we need to copy this information. And this means that like, and if you think like uh, uh, how many times you need to copy, then uh, how many chances of actually making a typo or making a mistake. When this happens, actually sometimes we, these mistakes uh, in can happen in a portion of the our DNA of our book that does not have an effect our on our life, and sometimes it's actually what makes us different. Why have uh, brown eyes and you have blue eyes? 
but then for in sometimes it's also a push for evolution. But if it happens inside of one of these words, this can create a mutation that can affect the function of the protein and so leading to a protein that is no more functional, affecting at the end the cell function. And if you think, if uh, we leave the analogy of the book now with this last example, just saying that between these there is just one letter different, but the meaning is definitely not the same. But then if you, if you copy this uh, many, many times, you know, we need to replace, uh, I'm glad you liked, <laughs> if you need to um, uh, copy this information many times and there is a mistake, uh, this means that with the time we can create an organ that is no more functional. And this is why all our organs in our body are susceptible to disease. Um, now, I for introducing, introducing to you the core of my topic, which is gene therapy, I want to focus on a specific organ, which is the immune system or the blood-derived cells. You will see soon why. Um, so the blood cells uh, are one of the, the peculiarity of the cells of these cells is that they reproduce all our life. It's one of the cells that proliferate or divide the most. Their home is actually in the long bones of our body. So in in the spine, in the femur, and uh, the home is called bone marrow. And inside here you can find this uh, stem cell, let's say, that can, can <coughs> generate red blood cells, the one that carries oxygen throughout our body, and lymphocytes. What is important about these lymphocytes, uh, or white blood cells, is that they protect us from ba virus, bacteria. So we are, uh, we are able to cope with the flu because of those cells, otherwise we may die. So if you imagine that there is a mutation that affects uh, one cell like this, you can imagine the output. Well, actually, that's the case of the first disease that has been cured back to the 90s, or uh, the first approach of gene therapy has been made, which is called adenine deaminase severe combined immunodeficiency, or ADASHID for friends. Well, it's quite a long number, we don't need to focus on this, but what I want to tell you is basically that uh, it's a mutation in this protein called ADA, that uh, now you know what is a protein that comes from a gene, which means there is a mutation, a type in the gene coding for HADA. And then this protein is involved in cell division. So basically these cells that they proliferate like crazy, they divide like crazy when a bacteria comes to your body, they are not able to survive. So we don't have this anymore part of the body that is called immune system or uh, adaptive immunity. And so basically the kids, it's a really rare disease, one out of 100,000, the kids die because uh, of immune system malfunctioning. So it comes a flu and the kids die. How they could survive, what were the therapies? You may have heard of these kids affected by the disease as bubble kids. Because the only way available to the 1990 to survive for those kids was actually living inside a shell, protecting them from the outside environment so that they couldn't interact with people, they couldn't touch, and everything was filtrated. And of course I'm speaking about uh, kids that were affected in countries that had this technology available. And um, the few therapies available was bone marrow transplantation, which is still nowadays an option. So the bone marrow, as I mentioned before, is the home for these cells that we have in our body here, here, here. And, uh, but this is available only in one fourth of the case because of match uh, needed. Another therapy available was uh, uh, taking this protein from a cow and putting in the in the kids. But this was, uh, with time, was becoming inefficient, and then those kids were not able to survive because of this. Then in 1990s, after more than two, 20 years of speaking about this approach, uh, here it comes the first gene therapy trial, 1990. How does this gene therapy finally work? Let's have a look. So what you need to do, you need to take the cells uh, from the spine of the patient, so uh, meaning there's a bone marrow, and then you have the cells that carries this mutation, right? If we think about ADA. Then what you need to do, you need to insert the therapeutic gene. So the gene that I mentioned to you before is without this uh, typo. And you need to insert inside the cells in the way that those cells are actually, they can actually produ pro produce the correct protein. Then what you need, you expand the cells in a lab. That's why it's called ex vivo gene therapy, because you take something outside of the body, you work on this in a lab, and then you put it back into the patient. To do, put it back in the patient, often you also need to do some uh, chemotherapy to kill the old uh, sick cells to allow the new ones to be, to gra to be grafted. So this is the general approach for gene therapy, I hope uh, was clear enough. But one point that I think it's really cool to raise is this about uh, using a delivery vehicle. Because we need to carry inside the cells this correct gene. And one of the most, um, I think, fascinating part about this is that actually what we use to carry this, or what one of the things we use, is actually a virus. 
So you may think, okay, viruses are dangerous, you know, which actually are. Uh, so how come that someone thought to turn in these uh, foes into friends, let's say? Well, just you just need to see about the biology of what a virus is. A virus is nothing but an envelope that contains pieces of information, genes, uh, so pieces of uh, DNA. But th per se, they cannot survive, they cannot replicate. They need to find a host cell. And um, to find this host cell is usually one of our the cells of our body, of other organisms. And then once inside, they can use the machinery belonging to the cells to replicate and survive and spread. But this often for the cell is pathological, is uh, create a disease because the cells die or get uh, recognized by the immune system. So what the scientists thought back at the time was, why don't we take this ability of a virus to infect the cells, this is the HIV virus, you take out the bad things from it, and you put inside what you want to be expressed, the correct gene, ADA, in the case I explained you. Then you infect the target cell, and then you correct it. So this is the general approach which uh, was started in the 90s, but still nowadays uh, is actually one of the most used one because you have uh, many different virus, HIV, herpes virus, adenovirus that are used modif after modification to cure people. There are also others that I don't, I'm not focusing now, I just want to mention this approach that you will hear a lot in the news in the next 10-20 uh, years because it's kind of a breakthrough that will speed up much more this gene therapy. Anyway, till 2015 at least, most of the clinical trial testing, so gene therapy on different disease, was actually made by virus. So, where are we now? 1990, first gene therapy for this disease. And, but we have to reach 2016 to get the first uh, drug approved for this disease, which is anyway the second drug approved in the world using gene therapy. So we have a gap of more or less 22 years. Well, in the 90s, there was a lot of excitement. Thousands of clinical trials started using this technique. But then in the early 2000s, some tumors appear in some patients undergoing this uh, clinical trial, and also some died. So there was a step back in the research, and then we spent the last 15 years trying to improve the situation with safety studies, new regulations, and vector improvement to avoid this from happening. And I believe that now we are at the point where we know much better also because of the technology. To finish the, the topic, giving you one last concept, uh, I thought that you may think, okay, you know, we have uh, gene therapy uh, for other shit, 25 years, billions and billions of uh, dollars, euro, whatever, invested in this approach. But then we, ki we cure, you know, one kid every 100,000. Every life matters, of course, maybe there were other ways. Uh, can I ask you, how many of you have heard of other shit before than tonight? Okay, well, two, okay. <laughs> this was more successful. Uh, how many of you actually know one of these diseases? Please raise your hand if you know at least one. Okay, everybody. So, this is the future of gene therapy. All of these diseases and many more are actually under clinical trial for gene therapy. Most of it are actually cancer research, cardiovascular, infectious, neurological, ocular disease. So this means that there are over 50 millions of people affected by those pathology every year that are potential target for gene therapy. So I hope you see, as I see also, the great potential inside this approach, this medical revolution, let's say. So my take-home message for you is that it's fundamental to share knowledge, to share your expertise with people that are actually not from your field. Because I think mm, gene therapy resembles a beautiful example of this. Because here we have uh, experts in virus that share their knowledge with stem cell biologists, so studying how lymphocytes uh, get uh, aff affected, with the genetic engineer or molecular biologist. So like exactly, you know, that's why I also wanted to come here to discuss with you, because I may have get not about gene therapy, but nice inputs afterwards. And then they came together creating this beautiful approach that is gene therapy, and that allowed these two girls that were the first one treated with gene therapy in the 1990 to live a totally normal life while they would have died by the age of four. Thanks all. Thank you very much, Gianluca. Now we have time for some questions. Also be aware that I will repeat the question after you say it. Don't be surprised so that we can hear it clearly on the live stream and on the videos. So who has some questions? There is a question. Yeah, Haris, please. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Let me repeat the questions first. So the first question was, which of the gene editing methods you think is n most efficient currently from what exists? 
And the second question is, um, since there were some problems in the 90s, it's quite unlikely that the ethics committees will approve the new uh, adenovirus associated um, uh, adenoviral, yes, adenoviral treatments. So what's the alternative that we can then suggest, right? Okay, um, I think you really know a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I hope I don't say something wrong. Uh, for sure, regarding the, se the first question, so what could be the future of this, which of these editing uh, possibilities could be the future, I think is indeed Cas9 that I mentioned before, which now I cannot speak about this topic, which would require one hour just, uh, but it's definitely one of the biggest breakthrough and uh, I'm sure that we'll win Nobel Prize in the next years for this. And anyway, this uh, Cas9 in is indeed a, a technique which is much safer, much more precise, and uh, much faster and also cheaper, so it looks perfect, but still a bit to work on, than the one of virus. But for the moment, uh, to the technology available and to the clinical trial that we are still, I think some kind of virus are eligible, and it always depends on the disease that you want to target. Uh, regarding the second question, so uh, this was quite specific for the death uh, of that happened because they in fact, they I told you we you use a virus to cure, modified virus to cure people, but the the people that got this virus was actually uh, reacted to this and died because of the vector itself. Um, this I don't think uh, I, we can have a look at the graph of the different virus use. And you can see adeno adenovirus are still the top use till 2015. So I guess I'm not an expert on how they modified them to make them less immunogenic, probably with the, the specific, with the serotype. So uh, if there is still 20% on, I guess these are this means that they are still using quite a lot. Okay, thank you. Yes, there is another question, please. So I'm okay. curious about the mechanics of it. So uh, if you remove the virus, the carbo of it, uh, the bad thing, and you replace it with something good, then you also mm -hmm. remove the virus's ability to uh, replicate itself. Is it, uh, my question is, would it be possible to create a virus that replicates itself, but also replicates the good genes itself? Uh. Yes, the question is, is it possible to create a virus which doesn't have the harmful parts, but still can replicate and replicate the good parts that we want to trans transport? Well, by law, it's actually one of the few regulations that has been made uh, internationally is that, that if you use a viral vector, the point is that viral vector cannot reproduce if you want to use it for gene therapy because of safety issues. So I don't think this point will, uh, will be used. You would rather use the ability of the, you would rather target stem cells with the virus so that and then with the something that integrates in the DNA so that they can carry to the daughter cells because this would be much more effective. What you mentioned, it exists for other kind of approach for cancer, but I don't think now I should go so much into details. We I can tell you about it later because it's more specific hardcore biology. Uh, that I don't know if everybody's interested, but th what you mentioned, it exists, but for other purposes, more for cancer research. With a different, I spoke about ex vivo and this about in vivo gene therapy. So it's another side of the approach. Okay, um, more questions you have? Uh, yes, please. So, a story for this is also a bit different to the therapy against cancer. Um, if I'm not mistaken, the immunotherapy is also considered as a gene therapy. So, what do you think about that, like targeting, like inducing a human body white cell to target the cancer cells? So, the question concerns uh, the gene therapy or kind of gene therapy that is used to um, induce Im immunogenic reaction to the cancer. And what can you comment on that? Well, this is uh, actually, this exists. You kind of already gave the answer to <laughs> your question because it happens, it's made, and it connects a bit to what he said. So that's a totally part of gene therapy in their broader meaning of modifying a cell to cure something. It's just the way of action that is different. But uh, it's totally done to, to take lymphocytes, modify them to target a cell, especially depends on the kind of tumor. But also, guys, if you have more basic questions, don't be scared and ask, uh, because these are really cool questions, but they are hardcore biologists. Yeah. So Harry so somehow <laughs> rose up the plank very high <laughs> in the beginning. But yeah, guys, you, I, I suggest that with the more basic questions than you discuss in the break, now we need to move on to the next talk. It's not that I don't like the basic questions. This is not the case. Um, I just don't want our next speaker to wait. So please uh, thank Gianluca again and please approach him in the break to ask more questions. <laughs>